Good morning, and welcome to the fourth and final day of our fourth annual 360 Open Summit. I'm Graham Brookie, Director of the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Research Lab. And I'm Rose Jackson, Director of the DFR Lab's new Democracy and Tech Initiative. We start today with an all-star panel I can't wait to hear from, featuring four exceptional leaders studying, documenting, and working to change how tech is impacting society globally. We'll then hear from scholars and activists about building an inclusive online ecosystem that isn't outright hostile to half of the world's population. We will hear from leaders working the statecraft necessary to govern technology that doesn't actually recognize our national borders. And we'll hear, or we'll welcome back some of the familiar faces to 360 Open Summit who have shared this platform with us since we built it. Finally, we'll finish with a conversation about what it means to be proactively for democracy in our hyper-connected world and how to center human rights in building and governing technology. You'll notice today some guest MCs as well, and we're excited that you'll get to meet a few of the incredible DFR Lab team that have made this event run. As always, make sure to follow along and add to the conversation on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, tagging our DFR Lab and Atlantic Council handles and using hashtag 360OS. If you're registered and tuned in on the Socio app, join the conversation and continue to send questions throughout our live conversations. Now, for our first panel, each of the people who you're about to hear from are leaders who we look up to. Their lived experience and steadfast example have guided many of us around the world, and their perspectives are invaluable in solving for the challenges that we face. We're happy to pass to DFR Lab non-resident fellow and co-founder of UNICEF Innovation Unit, Erica Kochi, to kick things off for the final day of 360 OS. Hi everyone, great to be here. I'm super excited to introduce this panel today. Uh, first, uh, we have uh, Nanjala Nayabola, who's a writer, uh, independent researcher and political analyst based in Nairobi. And her work focuses on the intersection between politics, society and technology. Uh, she's a frequent contributor to publications like The Nation and Foreign Affairs and is the author of Digital Democracy, Analog Politics, how the internet era is transforming politics in Kenya, and also Traveling While Black, essays inspired by the life on the move. Uh, second of all, we have Catherine Marr, uh, who uh, was with all of us on day one as well. She's the former CEO of the Wikimedia Foundation. And prior to Wikimedia, she held leadership roles at Access Now, the World Bank, the National Democratic Institute, and UNICEF. And she shapes uh, innovation agendas for international development, human rights, and democratic participation. And then last but not least, we have uh, Maria Ressa, who has uh, been a journalist in Asia for over 35 years and is the co-founder of Rappler, the top digital-only news site that is leading fight for press freedom in the Philippines. And as Rappler's CEO and president, Maria has endured constant political harassment and arrest by the Duterte government. For her, her courage, uh, uh, around this work on dis disinformation and fake news. Maria has received many accolades and I'm so excited to have all of these uh, wonderful women here with us today to talk about the public square, the digital public square. So to kick us off, uh, I would like to ask each of the participants, starting with Maria, do you think it's accurate to describe social media platforms as public squares? <laughs> I wish. I, I mean, you know, it is it's default uh, where we gather, but I would compare it more to, uh, especially with these these micro targeting tools that it uses. It's more like a behavior modification system, and those of us who voluntarily enter are part of an experiment that that makes us like Pavlov's dogs were experimented on in real time and the consequences are disastrous. I mean, if you look at it, Facebook is the world's largest distributor of news. And yet all the studies, I mean, this is for social media in general, they've shown that lies laced with anger and hate spread faster and further than facts. So you can actually argue that the social media platforms that deliver the facts to you are actually biased against facts and they're biased against journalists. And this is, I think, what's turned our world upside down because if you don't have facts, you can't have truth. Without truth, you can't have trust. If you don't have trust, you don't have a shared reality. You can't have a foundation for democracy. You can't, at any meaningful 
human endeavor becomes impossible. And this is the crisis that we're facing today. Yeah. Um, Nanjala, over to you. Uh, I know we had a discussion about this earlier on, but I'd love to hear your views on this. Do you think it's accurate to describe social media platforms as public squares? I think it's accurate to describe them as part of the public sphere. I think it's accurate to describe them as places where people go to have their opinions heard and places where people go to engage with their governments, to engage with the public services. And, you know, I think especially in countries whereby the social media companies don't necessarily see the publics there as natural audiences or as natural extensions of their market you actually find people taking on these tools that were designed for something else and applying them into their political lives, into their political realities. So we've had massive protests, for example, resistances against the excesses of power, um, roads must fall, my dress, my choice. In many African countries, because there's been this massive retreat of the traditional media, we don't really have a robust media, the social media starts to play this role whereby people go there, as Maria was saying, to get their political information and to, to get their um, connection to the po political space, but also using these tools and going beyond that and using them as the primary way through which they can organize. So maybe not a one-to-one -one substitution, but certainly an extension of a lot of the characteristics that we see um, in the analog public sphere. And just because of the, the agency and the creativity that people have applied to the social networking sites that is over and above what the makers of the sites might have had in mind. Yeah, Catherine, what about you? What are your thoughts on this? I mean, I think that there's sort of a differentiation between the legal question of our social media platforms, public squares, and understanding that, you know, for all sort of intents and purposes, they are, are not. They're private spaces, and the platforms have the rights and also the responsibility to do what they would like to do to uphold their policies and community standards in those spaces. Um, but in some very practical ways, I, I think I would second what Nanjala and Maria have already said, which is these are the venues in which we do express um, both discontent and you know, um, elation uh, in our lives and in the context of the way that we are governed. I think the the analogy of the public square takes on sort of a more pressing um, uh, resonance at this point in time, given that even within our public squares in many places in the world, we are facing you know, real threats to freedom of expression, uh, those threats to freedom of expression that are compelled by force. Uh, we are seeing public squares cleared, both in the digital metaphorical space and in the online real world. And so to the extent that there is a distinction between sort of the nature of public versus private and the function that, that we use these squares for, I think that there are a lot of similarities and, and probably much to learn from the tactics tactics of, of resistance uh, to efforts to censor and, and to silence. Can you bring a real life example to that, Catherine? I think what you're saying is really important, but I think having it resonate uh, with people and, you know, their memory, recent memory of what's been happening, uh, as well as like Maria or Nandala, if you want to jump in, I think, you know, what we're talking about is still kind of abstract and I'd really like to bring it down to what's happening around the world and what could be, ha what could happen in the future. I actually would defer to, to Maria and Angela. I think that they have some immediate examples that would probably really help um, bring this all out of the out of the Zoom boxes. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Um, so one example that I, I spend a lot of time with in my book is about the women's movement in Kenya. And we're talking about a sociopolitical context in which it's not outright um, uh, marginalization in the way that people think about. Like it's women work and women um, own businesses and do all of these things. But patriarchy is very strong in Kenyan society. So for example, um, a lot of communities, women are not allowed to own land and to own property in their own names. Um, and one place where it manifests actually is in the analog public sphere, whereby we have these unspoken morality codes about how women should dress in public and, and the consequences not being legal, but actually harassment, abuse, um, and violence. And in response to one of these incidences in 2014, we had a massive online mobilization by the women's uh, movement in Kenya that resulted in the hashtag My Dress My Choice. My Dress My Choice happened on Twitter, it happened on, on Facebook, it was also, you know, nascent, WhatsApp was still very nascent, but was also a site where people were, women especially, were organizing around um, harassment and violence, not as a quote-unquote morality issue, but as a public safety issue. And this is violence, and this is assault, and it's abuse. And it's the first time, certainly in living memory, that we've seen 
government responding and charging the men who are perpetrating these acts with assault, as opposed to treating it as some kind of violation of, as I said, quote unquote, morality. But the big thing is that for radical feminists in Kenya, there was no space in the analog public sphere. Feminism was always discussed as a, as a dirty word. Um, some of the iconic Kenyan women that you would think about, Wangari Mathai, are women who had the backlash, tremendous backlash by everyone in the society because they're women who are leaving, living outside the, the norms or the codes that uh, are unspoken codes in the society. So feminism, identifying as a feminist was a huge uh, personal um, risk, right? And, and you would end up being treated as some kind of stranger. Um, so for radical feminism, the digital space in Kenya, the digital space has been tremendous in not just advocating for women's rights and women's safety, but in articulating radical feminism as a political discourse. What are we against? What do we stand against? For bringing in, uh, making it a broad tent, bringing in LGBTQ plus rights in a country whereby um, homosexual acts are still punishable by 14 years imprisonment. Um, it's allowed people to find each other in a in an analog context whereby you couldn't even say out loud that you were gay, you couldn't even say out loud that you were a radical feminist. And being able to communicate somewhat freely on online spaces gives momentum to these movements and these movements result in very key changes um, in, the, in the analog public sphere. The same vein, you know, we had the repeal section 162, which is the section that prohibits homosexuality in Kenya. The fact that LGBTQ plus Kenyans were able to organize, were able to put out statements, were able to actually be in conversation with the rest of the public in a country where the traditional media will never publish anybody who has homosexuality anywhere in their bio, will never mm -hmm. give, put them on television, will never put them on radio. It was a tremendous um, boost to the, to the movement and it allowed for space in the public, in both digital and the public for a conversation that the traditional public sphere had been stifling since probably Kenya began. Mm. Uh, I, I, would argue, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I would almost argue the opposite, Jala, in the sense that I think, yes, I agree it was empowering at the beginning, but I think that the tide turned, at least in the Philippines. Yeah. Uh, the Philippines for the sixth year in a row, uh, has uh, Filipinos spend the most time online and on social media globally, six years in a row. So. Uh, Firsthand, I mean, in less than two years, the Philippine government has filed 10 arrest warrants against me. So I've posted bail 10 times just to be able to do my job uh, as a journalist. And, you know, beyond that, it's the same methodology attacks bottom up. In 2017, government propagandists tried to trend the hashtag arrest Maria Ressa. It didn't trend. So they they just kept at it. And two years later, I was arrested twice mm -hmm. in a little more than a month. So you know, uh, in 2016, uh, we wrote investigative pieces showing you how the the kind of social media, the weaponization of social media happened. Uh, and we, we called out the impunity on two fronts. President Duterte and his brutal drug war, human rights activists put the death toll in the tens of thousands. That violence in the drug war was facilitated and it was fueled by social media, by American social media companies, right? So based on this, on big data analysis that we did, we reported the networks that would, were manipulating us online. They were targeting and attacking, not just journalists, but human rights activists, the truth tellers, pounding to silence. And this is, this is the goal, anyone challenging power, right? So, well, it's only gotten worse today. Uh, and Silicon Valley since came home to roost on January 6th with mob violence on Capitol Hill. What happens on social media doesn't stay on social media and online violence leads to real world violence. I, I'll add just one last thing, which is how this is all connected to geopolitical power play, right? Because as we're talking about the coronavirus, there's this equally dangerous and insidious, I, I've started calling it the virus of lies that's been unleashed in our information ecosystem. It's seeded by power, wanting to stay in power, spread by algorithms that are motivated by profit. It's a business model Shoshana Zuboff calls surveillance capitalism. The reward is our attention. And that is linked to the geopolitical power at play. 
you know, the EU has slammed Russia and China for their intensified vaccine disinformation campaigns. And then this again becomes personal. Last September, Facebook took down information operations from China that were campaigning for the daughter of Duterte for president next year in our presidential elections. It was creating fake accounts for US elections and it was attacking me. I'm just one journalist, right? So all of this is connected. Anyway, I'll, yeah. I'll, so it's very personal if, and also scary. Yeah, yeah. if I if I may, um, I by all means would never categorize myself as entirely optimistic because I do agree with you. And one of the points that I I, I like to make is that the reason why we had this use of social media in this way in a lot of African countries is because the social media companies did not see Africa as a site did not see it as a market, did not see it as a place that was worth paying attention to. And because people were not paying attention to it, then all of these, you, you didn't have this investment in the negative for a long time, and that allowed the positive to flourish. Mm. The tide is definitely turning. The tide has definitely changed. And in fact, I end digital democracy with the 2017 election because um, Cambridge Analytica, which is a name that everybody's aware of right now, their first operations, India 2011, Kenya 2013, Kenya 2017, Right. So we've had the same thing, massive investments in misinformation campaigns. A lot of it, you know, Cambridge Analytica, British company, Harris Media, uh, American company, a lot of money coming from outside to influence political conversations in Kenya because of this realization that Africa is a place where conversations, um, where there's money to be made, you know, to put it quite simply, where there's money to be made. And so until the beginning of this year, Twitter's Africa office was in Dublin. Last month, um, Jack Dorsey announces that he's moving to Ghana for six months. Until 2015, Facebook's Kenya Africa office was a sales office in Johannesburg. At the beginning of 2019, Facebook went on a tremendous hiring spree and has expanded its operations in Africa so, so that right now the Africa office is actually a fully fledged um, a regional office, the same way as the one that exists in Germany as exists um, in the UK. All of this is changing and it's super dynamic. And I think what you said about how the people in the Philippines use the internet, uh, use social media more than any people in any other country, I think it's that lag that right now, when I started writing um, in, 20, in 2007, there were 100,000 Kenyans on Twitter. Now there's almost 2 million and it's growing exponentially. And I think as that happens, the goods will also intensify, but so will the bad. So will the opportunity for predation. And that's why it's really important to understand what's happening in other parts of the world, because it's all connected, as you said. A lot of the things that made June 6 happen in the United States are things that were practiced, seeded, misinformation campaigns, tactics that were being tested in other parts of the world um, before they were being perfected in the United States. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. I think, you know, one of the things that you're really hinting at here are like really sort of coming pushing us towards is how uh, not just um, financial reasons, but also how power drives a lot of the narratives that are happening in uh, the digital online world. And uh, Maria and Anjala and Catherine, I know you all have some, some thoughts about uh, the power and money dynamic that's driving these uh, online platforms. Uh, Catherine, I'd like to start with you, because uh, I know you have some great examples from your time uh, at Wikipedia to share. Oh, I mean, I, I think that, Nanjal, I'm so glad that you brought up this issue of where the offices are based, because I think that this is absolutely key to really thinking about whether products and platforms are serving the communities that are now using uh, these products globally what in a way that is meaningful and, and sort of um, tailored to the needs of those communities. I think that uh, we're all very familiar, or perhaps the listeners uh, who are here today are, are I hope that if not, you'll be familiar by the end of this conversation with this idea that most of these platforms have been built out of Silicon Valley. Most of the policies have been built out of Silicon Valley. Most of the policies and practices that are utilized to govern these platforms, both internal policies to the platforms, but also the ways in which they are governed um, from a legal standpoint are uh, really based off US laws and norms. And when those are expanded out globally, you know, 
they do sometimes run into very real world challenges of not being applicable, not being enforceable, not being appropriate, all of these sorts of questions. Now, I think that the, the connection here is something that you, you started to speak to, but I'm really explicit, which is that historically, most of these platforms did not see the rest of the world as a market. The market was the United States, the market was Europe, it was where you could make money, it was where you could sell ads, so it was where the infrastructure was developed, it was where the investments were made, and basically the rest of the world, you know, good luck. <laughs> and so I think that one of the things that is really this transformational change, and I don't, you know, we can talk about whether it's good or whether it's bad to the point of whether, you know, late stage capitalism is good or bad, is that we are now increasingly seeing platforms be aware of the market power of other parts, other regions of the world, the increasing um, economic power of individuals living in different countries outside of sort of the Western, Western Europe and, and North America. And what is interesting, and I think, Eric, what you're trying to tease out is this idea that all of the product decisions that are made are really ultimately in service of sort of the maximum revenue per user, the maximum time on site, um, and those lead to certain decisions around what kind of services that these companies build, but also what decisions that they make relative to enabling censorship or enabling privacy or disallowing privacy on their platforms. And so a great example of this that we've seen play out time and time again is when governments go to platforms and say, we, you, we don't like this content. We don't like the way that you're enabling people to speak about something that is a challenge to the current government um, in power. We don't like the fact that this says something perhaps accurate, but um, and, but dis defamatory, I mean, no, that's not correct, accurate, but um, un unflattering about a leader in power. And so we're going to ask you to take this down. And if you don't comply and don't take this down, we're going to shut off market access to 10 million people, 80 million people, 200 million people who would otherwise bring value to you and your advertisers. And so those connections of uh, the value per user, the value per market are driving the policy decisions. And that's where we start to run into real questions about, is it a public square? And the answer is, whenever you have a capital incentive, it is not a public square. And so I, I see Maria and Nanjala nodding, and I want to make sure that I can give them space to take the floor as well, because I'm sure they have much more to add. Yeah, Maria, you want to jump in first and then Anjala? Yeah, I mean, just picking up from what Catherine said, right, the uh, Shoshana Zuboff called it surveillance capitalism. But I think, you know, what what we have to look at is that the, the very platforms that deliver the news, the facts, the information we need to make accurate decisions in our lives are by design dividing us and radicalizing us. Uh, because they're largely, they're American companies, you know, it's positioned as a free speech issue, it isn't. Uh, and the users are blamed for a lot of the problems saying, well, people are really bad. No, these platforms are not mirroring our humanity. In fact, they're making all of us our worst selves by design because it brings in the most revenue. And here's, here's the part that I worry about the most, um, and, you know, I studied social networks because I was looking first at how the virulent ideology of terrorism, you know, how, how did that spread through social networks? How did it spread through social media? And that's when you go from the psychology of an individual to group psychology and how oftentimes the group exerts its own pressure. So an individual in a group will behave differently. Uh, and finally, when you have it at scale, which is what these platforms had, it's called emergent behavior, right? How we behave at scale right now is, it, is actually it's based on violence, on fear, on the very things that power the money that the platforms need, right? Violence, fear, uncertainty. And frankly, at least in my case, right, again, I could go to jail for the rest of my life enabled by the, the dystopia in our information ecosystem. So this is a, a problem that we need to solve. Nanjala, you want to jump in here? Um, I'm not sure that I have, um, I can be more profound in this way than both Catherine and Maria have to think. Um, there is a level of growing consciousness that we are at the mercy really of commercial policies, that our political processes, our public conversations are at the mercy of, of political decisions. So one of the things that I've been looking at the last year has been language and how language
language makes things possible and makes things uh, not, how we name things affects what we think they are. And the word that has been really um, stuck in my brain is the idea of community standards. And what, when a company says community, what do they actually mean? Um, are we actually talking about community in the way that we understand it in the colloquial sense? Or are we talking about an abdication of, of legal responsibility? Uh, you know what Maria was saying, making it our fault. You know, it's your fault that you didn't catch that hate speech. It's your fault that this thing um, went the way that it did. Um, and, and sort of twisting what we mean when we think about community, when we think about interdependence, when we think about relation, when we think about you know, solidarity and actually flipping that to, we're not going to do anything. If you want us, the site to be better, then you have to do all the work. And it's become really apparent, for example, when we talk about content moderation. Um, content moderation is a really interesting thing because um, most of Facebook's content moderation for the rest of the world is actually done in the Philippines. Um, and so we have people who are putting up posts in languages that are not even official languages in many of African countries. This has been a huge problem in Ethiopia. The official language in Ethiopia is Amharic, but a lot of the majority of Ethiopians don't speak Amharic as a first language in the sense that they have another language. And so the content moderation that's done in English in the Philippines isn't going to catch what hate speech people are spreading in Afan or Omo or in Somali or in Tigrinya. And this is stuff that is leading to conflict. You know, 68 people died in October of uh, year before last because of hate speech that was posted on Facebook that stayed up for about three days and people died over the 60 people died over the weekend and the community moderation fails because it's not really community we're not really in the same relation as we are but with your neighbors and the people that you see and you have to share physical space with and so what it really means is that no one is responsible that actually we're waiting the failure to invest in content moderation in African countries before rolling out the business practice, to me, there's a red flag about this whole tension, you know, what Kathy was talking about. When the capitalist interests, when the profit-making interests supersede the interest, the community interests, the well-being of the people, the well-being of the, of the society, can we really call it a public space a traditional word? And that's why I like, to, I think that it, it mimics the, the outlines of the public sphere and takes certain aspects of it it's maybe not a one-to-one -one substitution in the way that um, um, the people who make the site might want us to think. Yeah, one of the things that, um, you know, all of your points sort of are, are leading me to is really that there's very, very little, when bad things happen, and, you know, not just online, but they jump into the real world of, uh, you know, the analog world, there's very, very little opportunity to, for redress. Uh, or, uh, and then there, there's also very little accountability, um, you know, with these on, in real life implications of uh, online public discourse. So, I mean, one of the things that, that bothers me personally is that the sort of, the, the, the structures that we have for redress in our just, in a justice system, or even within our governments with uh, elected officials just doesn't exist. Uh, in this online global public square. I'd love for your thoughts on, well, A, how it doesn't exist and any um, examples that you can bring to, to the table here, but also what do you think should be in place beyond some of the regulation that's, uh, that's starting to, to come out of the EU and uh, you know, other, other places in the world? Uh, Catherine, should we start with you again? I was worried you were going to call on me first. No, I, I think I think that uh, <laughs> it's something that Angela said that I think is really important, which is this idea that we're we're really not talking about communities and the sort of uh, this paralyzation of content moderation and community moderation and what a community actually is. And I think that I'm just going to go out there and, and I'm going to stand up for the platforms just a tiny bit, which is to say that I don't think we know what we want them to do. And, and I'm not saying that human rights advocates don't have very specific understandings of how we defend human rights and journalists don't have very specific understandings of what they would like to see. But as a 
as a whole, as societies, as even just the three of us on this panel, I think we would struggle to come up with a set of sort of solution oriented asks out of platforms that would feel comprehensive and meaningful to address the diverse set of challenges that we have. And the reason I am saying this is because when we talk about sort of the norms of the public square, each of our public squares, the proverbial public square existed in a community to Nanjala's point. And that community had its own norms. It had its own norms about power sharing time, you know, space sharing around voice, um, around what was appropriate language, what was incitement. Um, they, those norms did not work perfectly in the offline space of governance. They still do not work perfectly. We've had lots of conversations probably throughout this week about the real challenges and threats that exist within the governance space of democracies, let alone robust democracies today around the world, let alone these conversations that are happening in the online space. And so although they were imperfect, they were community-based practices and norms that became the basis for all of our laws, our you know legislative bodies, um, the ways that we think about jurisprudence and, and um, precedent the internet and the network at the scale of 3 billion people has only existed, not, not just for the 30 years that we've been on the web, but the scale of 3 billion people has really only existed for the last few years that we've all been connected. And I think we struggle to be able to articulate what kind of community norms we want at that scale. And so I'm a big advocate of going smaller on these issues and trying to scale back to the size of community-based standards and community-based norms, but to the answer, so that, I think that kind of it gets a little bit to what should be in place, not so much around redress, although I do think that there are some interesting sort of questions there, um, but really around sort of community-based standards and norms. And I think that platforms have not done a very good job of spending and internalizing to their own sort of cost structures. What does it mean to bring, to bring out, um, to draw out what the community ex expectations and community norms are for a lot of these platforms. Instead, they try to apply sort of one size fits all solutions um, that, you know, and I understand that many of those are actually truly and meaningfully grounded in the human rights space, but they tend to break down when they are all subject to individual tests, um, such as the way that the Facebook Oversight Board seems to be moving around individual tests of rights, rather than understanding how these apply um, at the scale of the network and what sort of precedent it sets. Uh, so that that's sort of what I, I would add to the conversation. And I, I again, I'm seeing Maria nodding, but I'm also seeing Nanjala with a with a, maybe a little bit of disagreement. And so I think that that's, that's a healthy place for us to be. So I, I'd love to hear from both of them. Okay, um, Nanjali, you want to jump in here, and then we'll go to you, Maria. It's not so much a disagreement as it is. Um, I, I I do think that there's something to uh, almost de um, breaking up our idea of, of social networks. To stop thinking of it at a global level and start thinking about it at a smaller level. It doesn't necessarily have to be national. It doesn't have to be tied to national boundary, but certainly disaggregating. Um, and, and stop, sort of move away from the, um, you know, I always keep going back to antitrust laws of the Great Depression period and sort of moving away from that uh, federal oil model of, of let's go take over the whole world and starting to think small. I think there's something to that. And I think that's what's starting to happen, but it isn't coming organically. It's, it's coming because a lot of countries are starting to threaten nationalization, that you have to have a local office. There has to be someone in this country that we can sue. Um, for all the things that you do when you be upset us and you do all of these things. And I think that the companies are trying to get ahead of that energy because it's definitely coming down the pipeline. And certainly in a lot of African countries, it's definitely coming down the pipeline. Um, I think that what really, one of the things, I, I do think though that there is precedent. And I think that one of the things that the companies are going to have to sit with is that they will have to scale back their profitability in the interest of securing the public good. I think, for example, investing in well-resourced content moderation will require having well-resourced content moderators in every single country that you're operating. That's a tremendous amount of money. But what's happening right now is that the costs are being externalized as non-monetary costs, so they're not being measured, but we're still living with them. And so what looks like a savings is actually that the non that it's we have non-monetary costs that are not being put into the accounting. 
And so thinking about it, I mean, I know in the environmental movement, this is something that's happened a great deal. People are starting to think more concretely about externalities, about, you know, what does climate change mean? Even if you've made XYZ money and you put this many tons of CO2 in the air, how much is that CO2 costing us? You know, how much, and, and, and does it have to be in financial terms? I think that's maybe something that we need to start thinking. Is it a question of, I know Twitter start, uh, started doing this a while back, but has uh, not been as vocal about it, but making it more robust, the idea of accounting for the non-monetary costs um, of having these things. And from a philosophical perspective, I'll tell you one thing that I struggle with is maybe we're not supposed to be communicating as much as we are. Like, and I, 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 I really struggled with articulating what that means. It's really at this point just an instance. But again, when you have to pay for a text message, when you have to pay 15 cents for a text message, when you try to make sure that whatever is in that text message is really important, right? It's something that is worth that 15 cents because that adds up. You send 10 text messages a day, you spend a dollar fifty. Because there is no financial cost to a lot of the communication that we're doing, that we're that we're conscious. Of course, there is a thing for internet and all that stuff. I think that we are absorbing those costs in other ways. And so we think that um, it's not costing me anything to put this message up or to send out this tweet. But as Maria was talking about, you know, the attention economy, the surveillance economy, there's all these other costs that need to be accounted for. So is it a question of getting better as both the digital rights movement and the people who are working with the platforms? at accounting for the non-monetary costs of what it is that we're building and what it is that we're participating in. So that's kind of where I would start um, mm -hmm. with thinking about what would effective regulation and sort of curbing, I guess, the excesses, what would that look like? Yeah, Maria, on to you. I'm gonna take I'm gonna take bits and pieces, I think, you know, uh, of both Catherine and Nanjala. Uh, look. Catherine, you mentioned the Facebook Oversight Board, right? And it's set up like it's a Supreme Court and it is trying to put a system of justice in place at a glacial speed while this platform it's attempting to regulate moves at the speed of light. So you're talking about like um, the birth rate of humans versus Drosophila fruit flies. It doesn't work. <laughs> And so, you know, uh, I'm, uh, I sit on the real Facebook oversight board and we try to put pressure so that they actually do, I guess the basic assumption is this, why is it okay to move at a glacial speed to deal with the problems that you created at lightning speed, at warp speed? That's assumption number one. Assumption number two is, okay, so you have billions of people. So why would you not be held accountable for what happens to all those people? Why is there something like, a, why isn't there anything like a consumer protection board for all the users like me who are abused? The women, the LGBTQ, the women journalists are attacked. Uh, in the Philippines, um, women are attacked at least 10 times more than men. It brings out sexism, misogyny. It brings out the worst of human nature. So that's the other one. I think the third one is, it goes back to, and this is because I come from mass media. We could only expand at the rate of what we could be accountable for. It took me a year to set up the Jakarta Bureau for CNN because I had to go learn the culture, the language, and the laws. And when I set up that bureau in Indonesia, I was accountable for it. So why would tech be any different from that? And that leads right to, like, I guess, this last part, which is, if you can't handle the technology, why would you be making $29 billion in that income? I sound like I'm really against the tech platforms. Let me say I am the biggest fan of technology. Rappler remains a Facebook partner in the Philippines. We're one of only two Filipino fact-checking partners. I believe in the tech. We created Rappler in 2012 precisely because I was hoping technology would help jumpstart development in countries like ours, but the excesses and the greed of the people who are running it have now created, have now destroyed democracy. And the, again, this is documented. So I guess I'll end with just that one thing of, uh, I think this is E.O. Wilson, the biologist who said this, right? That the great, greatest crisis we're facing is that uh, we have, uh, Paleo, we're, we're 
Paleolithic emotions. This is where we're being manipulated insidiously so without our knowledge. Uh, medieval institutions that can't regulate it and godlike technology. So I go back and I'll, I'll agree with you in saying that um, maybe we shouldn't, we should go back to smaller, but how do you go there? I, I don't think it's that hard. Not if you go right back to the principles that have always been there in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. A lot of these things happened after news organizations lost the gatekeeping powers to the public sphere. And I guess this is where we go to the public sphere, right? The public sphere is, if you're a news organization, is governed by a set of standards and ethics, the mission of journalism that holds you accountable for that. And I guess that's what we're missing. The new gatekeepers get the money, get the power, but they're not accountable at any level. And we are all suffering for that. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that, you know, I've been thinking about a lot um, over the past few years is, well, how do you create that accountability? And, um, you know, obviously regulation is, you know, moves at a glacial pace. So I don't think that's just the, the right approach. But one of the things that's actually inspired me is other industries and how they've done it. So looking at, for example, uh, the food safety industry, I think has done some really interesting things. You know, you have uh, everyone from the farmer that's uh, you know, raising the cow to uh, the meat processing plant, and like when something goes wrong, how do you how do you really um, delineate where accountability lies? And obviously, that's you know very different sector, but I think that there are a lot of other sectors that we can draw uh, inspiration from. Um, do you see any other sectors or any places where you think we can really start thinking about how you put that accountability into action? Okay, Maria, I want to hear. <laughs> you know why? Because the other thing we haven't mentioned, of course, is Wikipedia, right? Like part of the, yeah. the problem that we have lost is the excitement that we had when before the Arab Spring became the Arab Winter, right? Before uh, when, when it really was an empowering, where technology empowered these voices. And I think Wikipedia is one of the last holding and they're holding it out for the, the wisdom of crowds. But when, the, when, the, when you lose independence of thought, when you're able to pummel uh, and you can't make decisions anymore, uh, you lose the wisdom of crowds and it becomes mob rule. So I guess Wikipedia is still holding it out, right? But I don't know if, if you agree with that, but uh, I, I, I'd love to hear from Catherine and then I'll dump some thoughts also, but I'll shut up. Yeah, absolutely, Catherine. That's end, but then I will come back to your specific recommendations on accountability. So think over that. Catherine. Well, I think one of the things that makes Wikipedia so incredibly different relative to these other platforms is the decentralization of the interpretations of policy and the decentralization of accountability uh, and decision making. And so what I mean by that, for those who don't know how Wikipedia works, is that it is a volunteer platform that is edited by people around the world. It exists in about 300 languages. Some of the largest languages like English are 6 million articles, hundreds of thousands of contributors. The smaller languages may just have a few dozen. Um, that actually speaks also to the quality model. The more people participate, the more high quality it is, particularly the more ideological diversity, sort of life experience diversity that you have, the more comprehensive, the more robust, but then specifically at the article level, also the more neutral or balanced the article actually is because you end up with people sort of really having to negotiate around complex topics that may have, that people may have genuine and legitimate differing viewpoints about, including sort of um, historical incidents or understandings of culture or religion um, in which there is no sort of ac one accuracy. One of the things that I think makes Wikipedia interesting potentially, and one of the reasons why I think a lot about some of the challenges of scale is that it, it doesn't scale. There's no centralized decision making or authority on the 55 million articles that exist. There are a series of sort of principles around what kind of purpose we want the platform to have um, that enable people to interpret them in the local context. And I don't just mean local in a way that says geographical, localized could be in the context of medical information. It could be in the context of information about literature 
interpret in the local context and negotiate what the norms are within the community that cares about that context and is responsive to that context. And because all of this happens sort of in public and anyone can participate, there is a built-in accountability mechanism um, around the decisions that Wikipedians make because anyone can become a Wikipedian and participate in those decisions. And so the public has a direct line of accountability, even if they choose never to participate in it. I think it's really baked into the sort of norms that have emerged for the platform over time and become sort of a, a, a sort of self, uh, a closed loop system that enables for every decision um, to be scrutinized and then inform the next set of decisions. I do want to say though, because I think it's really important to say it is imperfect. There are lots of issues. Um, we can don't want to make this a Wikipedia advertisement, but there are lots of issues with that system relative to who participates, who has power. Um, you know, we see a lot of exclusion of people from the global south. We see a lot of exclusion of women. Um, and of course, the platform is working actively to change that. But by and large, I tend to agree with Maria. I think that it is better as a model than many models. And I think there's a lot for other platforms potentially to be able to learn. But of course, a big reason why Wikipedia is successful is that it's mostly dependent on people putting it in the non, uh, non-profit making model. And this aggressive pursuit of profit is part of what colors what the other social networks are doing. Is that you're always cutting corners. You're always instead of doing content moderation, you do content moderation light. Instead of doing you know investment in um, uh, understanding local culture and local history, we're going to skip over that and, and not invest in understanding the communities that we're working. I mean, the 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 obvious answer, well, the starting point for me is you know in the early 20th century, media newspapers basically meant that people would be in their houses typing out flyers and handing them out, you know, to whoever would take them. There was no central organization, there was no central regulation. People would just write whatever they wanted. And libel laws, defamation laws have their history in the early 20th century, uh, 19th century as well, because of that, because you could literally say whatever you wanted, put it in a flyer and hand them out. And it was a, a combined effort of self-regulation. So you have media guilds and, and unions coming up with standards for themselves, but also public regulation, you know, defining what is libel, the hard limits, what is libel, what is defamation, what is slander, what is, you know, a, a, abuse, what is incitement to genocide, characterizing and describing that, and a combination of that and self-regulation creating a context in which the norms can become part of what we think is, is normal for a newspaper, right? We, we think it's normal for a newspaper to have fact checking, we think it's normal for a newspaper to have um, you know, all of these backstopping that happened to the back of, of news production, but it actually wasn't integral to the, to the system. It was something that was built. And, you know, to go back to the idea that, you know, social network, this is social media 4.0. Um, social media 1.0, you would think about Friendster, you would think about all of these old platforms. Then you had MySpace, um, you had, I think the only surviving um, site from the fake social media 2.0 is LinkedIn. Everything else has gone by the wayside. Um, and now we have 5.0 sort of, you know, um, beating down the doors, TikTok, um, you know, all of these new sites coming up and bringing to, uh, another different way of thinking about things. And so in terms of thinking about a model, I think it's still very nascent and there's still an opportunity for us to define both with the combination of, you know, conversations like this, conversations with people who are active on the platforms, who are enduring the worst of the platforms and who are seeing what the ugliness can look like and people who are benefiting from the platforms being in dialogue, but also being having some overarching hard limits established on, you know, these are things that will be unacceptable regardless of what happens. The ability to interfere in the political processes, political discourses with another country, that's a hard limit. Abuse, sexual assault, you know, encouraging sexual assault, incitement to violence, these are hard limits. And I think, um, sorry, just to add on, I think one of the challenges that has happened is that this idea of free speech, because these are Silicon Valley companies that are rooted in American legal practice, is this idea of the absolutism of free speech. And the absolutism of free speech is not a universal value. A lot of us live in countries where there are actually many limits to speech because we've seen what the excesses are. We've lived through genocide, we've lived through, and we are honest about having lived through genocide, that is something. Um, we are honest about having endured all of these um, excesses. And so, you know, there are things that you can't say in Kenya because of what happened in 2007. There are things that you can't say in Rwanda in the newspaper, in the magazine, 
whatever because of the 1994 genocide. There are things that you can't say in Germany because of the Holocaust. And I think, you know, having an honest conversation about the hard limits to um, what should be permissible on these platforms is not a uh, anti free speech uh, process. It's a recognition that the American approach is unique to American history. And actually, the rest of the world um, has always had a different way of thinking about the hard limits. You, you can't just say whatever you want um, on the newspaper because of certain histories that are attached to incitement and, and public discourse. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think, you know, the balancing of the various rights um, are, is obviously key in, the, in this space. I'm a bit conscious of time and we only have 10 minutes left. So I really want to get to all of you about what you think is the most important step that we need to be taking um, and who needs to be taking these steps specifically. Um, Maria, I know you've done a lot of work uh, out of the Infodemics Working Group. I'd love for you to talk about some of the recommendations that came out of there. Uh, and then uh, I'll pass to you, Catherine, and then Manjala. Okay, sure. Uh, so I, I look at this as three main pillars that will kind of restore some sense of a shared reality, because this virus of lies that I talk about, it, it, it infects real people and changes the way they look at the world and and cognitive biases. I guess I, I didn't explain that whole behavioral economics, the, the way we are being manipulated. But uh, once you're infected, it's just like getting the coronavirus. You're changed and you could literally, well, okay, let me not go there. So what is the solution? Um, November last year, a group of us in the, in the Forum on Information and Democracy uh, formed a, an infodemics working group. I co-chaired it along with former EU parliament member Marika Shakti. We came up with like a dozen uh, principles. Catherine talked about principles, right? One of the, a pet peeve of mine when we talk about content moderation is, is the kind of atomization into meaninglessness of how you moderate the public sphere. You don't moderate the public sphere by deciding on how much how much breast do you show? You moderate it through principles, something like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. You agree on standards and ethics, right? Uh, and then, um, anyway, so let me go back. 12 uh, uh, a kind of systemic solutions, and they are aligned with like not manipulating us insidiously, not taking machine learning and taking every post and building a model of each of us so that you can then feed our most vulnerable point. You can sell it, right? It's it's kind of like, I think it was Tristan Harris who said this, that it's like you went to a psychologist and then that psychologist just said, hey, hey, I've got the this story, this weak point of Maria and I'm going to sell it to you. How much will you give me for it? That's what's happening to each of us, each of the users on the platforms. So a lot, so those 12 systemic solutions, and then we came up with 250 others, principles that are easily used. I think beyond that, that's just the tech. Um, the, the second is you have to strengthen independent journalism because as the, the business model crumbled, the people who are challenging power, who are holding power to account have come under more um, pressure than ever. It's been a decade of decline all around the world. Uh, Jimmy Lai and Apple Daily just closed shop in Hong Kong. Jimmy Lai is in jail, right? Um, and then finally, the third is, we talked a little bit in the panel about community. Um, and you have some of the definitions, but right now, the community is global and it is truly sick. Um, and, and that's where I appeal, I go back. All of these things require time. The EU's democracy action plan requires time. Section 230 requires time. It is back to the social media platforms. I, this is where I continue to appeal for enlightened self-interest. Um, anyway, that's a long-winded answer. Let me, let me kick it back to you, to you guys. Yeah, Anjali. Catherine, uh, you want to jump in here and uh, very quickly, and Anjala, and then I, I have a couple questions uh, from the audience. 
Oh, okay. Very quickly then. Um, I would say improve, improve legislation regarding the transparency of advertising, not just on social media, but on ad networks in particular. I think that that's a real issue. Um, and it's sort of the dark, the dark advertising web um, needs, needs better accountability. Number two is a localized community driven standards. So that more than that's a hard thing to apply, but I would say uh, building on this idea that we've talked about that we're not one community um, we do have different communities. Then I would say autonomy for the implementation of those community driven standards in a the localized context, uh, whether that be linguistic, geographic or otherwise, but with accountability back to the central the central entities. So people need to be able to make decisions more quickly with more contextual understanding, but then there needs to be also sort of chains of accountability so if those decisions go wrong. And then finally, I would say clearer escalation pathways and case tracking. We talked about the glacial scale of um, appeals. It's places like the Facebook Oversight Board um, need, needing to understand sort of where things are in the pathway, not just the high profile cases, but for everyone. Those are just a few. Mm -hmm. Nanjala, to you. I think uh, my, I would just recommend one thing that is over and above what has already been discussed, which is we have to get, if this is, if these are going to be global platforms, then the conversations and regulation have to be global. And we have to have people from other parts of the world because as I said in the beginning, a lot of the things that the West is dealing with now are things that have been refine are things that have been perfected in countries that have a much weaker legislative regime before they're rolled out in the US. Like I said, King Generics like Kenya, 2013, 2017, same tactics, Nigeria, 2015, see, India, 2011. All of these things are things that we know and we've had experience with, but we're not in the conversation when it comes to deciding what the regulations look like, and we're not in the conversation when it comes to deciding what the future will look like. So definitely begin from there. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I have a couple questions from the audience. Uh, the first one is from Nanjala. What is your expectation for businesses to track non-monetary costs related to impact on the public square? So I think that there is, I think about environmental audits um, and I think about how <laughs> I'll, I'll, go, I'll go to Catherine first while your phone is ringing. Uh, Catherine, so um, as an audience member had a question on your I comment on going small, um, he or she would like to know what your thoughts are about building alternatives to the major platforms to restore the more local public squares that existed not so long ago before Facebook. Yeah, I mean, I think we're already seeing alternatives to major public platforms. We need to really be, I think we, particularly, particularly people in my generation need to be thoughtful when we're talking about what social media is, that we're often too frequently just talking about legacy social media. Um, and in reality, that's not necessarily the behavioral patterns of, of a new generation. I will say I'm not even on one of the larger social media platforms that we continuously talk about, like I've got an account, but I never use it. Um, and so when we talk about sort of the smaller platforms, there are spaces that exist in parallel to these large platforms. There are community driven spaces. There are um, ways in which people are building their own community and messaging sites. There are ways in which in these newer emergent technologies like TikTok are becoming the locus of conversations on critical issues for com distributed communities. So I don't think we want to over rotate on sort of what are we going to do about the fate, the, what are we going to do about Facebook question, because I think we're going to miss a lot of the ways in which emergent behaviors um, of digital connectivity are, are, are sort of coming along. Um, but what what I would say is like our small social media platforms going to come along and, and save the day from these large legacy ones. I'm gonna I'm gonna be a little bit skeptical because I I think that it's very hard to take on the network effects. There are conversations around interoperability, data portability. Can you actually have sort of um, the uh, um, the networks locally on the phone is sort of the way of having ownership over your over your own network graph. I think these are interesting, but I've yet to see anything really sort of break through at this point. So um, by all means, continue to experiment and innovate, but I, I'm not, I, I think it's less about trying to have a Facebook killer and more about what are the ways in which we meet some of the needs that this omnibus product is trying to serve so that we're not trying to do absolutely everything on one platform. Yeah, I think, um... Nanjala, perhaps we can go to you just for the final minute on yeah. your application for businesses to track non-monetary costs. 
Yeah, I think that uh, I've, like I said, the environmental movement has been very good about this and thinking about environmental audits in ways that are not just about the money. Um, when we think about offsetting and all of these other practices, it's about translating some of these non-monetary costs into language that can be understood, even if the restitution resolution isn't necessarily going to come from money. So first of all, it will be a question about identifying harms and spending a lot of time systematically thinking about what are the harms what are the opportunities? What are the gains and the losses that we're making? How do we quantify these? Um, a lot of people think about, there's already six, a lot of political science research on you know, the cost of civil war, exit, voice, loyalty. Like, What are some of these knock-on effects? How can we translate them into a way that even if it's not money, um, it's a way that makes sense for people who are doing business and people who are in industry. Um, and so, yeah, I would say just you know, to wrap up the conversation, Looking at what the environmental movement is doing in terms of thinking about externalities is a great way to start thinking about the externalities of social networking and all of these um, platforms that we've built. Yeah, we are just at time now. Um, I'm sorry to cut you off like that, Anjala, but I wanted to thank all of you so much for uh, your time and uh, your, your insights and for, I think, what is a very, very important conversation. So thank you so much. And I'll hand it back to Jacqueline.